Hey, welcome to the Road and Rail podcast. Did you ever feel like screaming out in the office on Zoom or outside the school gate? For the love of God, come on, really? And if this is you and you're looking for an honest, fun and frank podcast on life and business, then sit back and listen to me, Rona Morell. I'll be bringing great people on the show to talk, share and debate their life experiences and business challenges. Keeping the show unpolished, but with a fun and unique British style. With sarcasm, tenacity or maybe a few swear words or tears. This podcast keeps it real, honest, raw and removes the bullshit in the only way I know how. Through authenticity and getting shit done. Think of it less like the Housewives of New York or Towie with the lipo and drama and more like the house and lives of the real world. I hope you'll take something away to be better informed, laugh, smile or maybe even finally get in the confidence to shout, come on really. So enjoy. Hi Alan, welcome to the Road and Morale podcast. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So nice to see you. Oh, and to you, and I can just hear the beautiful birds tweeting. And um, just for my listeners out there, this is, uh, and I'm delighted to have Alan River on the podcast today, who is all the way over in sunny Sydney, Australia. So to hear those birds, it's just beautiful. Um, Alan and I first met probably about 18 months ago now, uh, when we were both working with a with a client in Australia, um, he was, he was looking at a zero alcohol beer and I think we both connected on it for different reasons. Alan is extremely experienced in the world of um, marketing content strategy. But one of the things that I've really connected with Alan with over the you know, over this time and what we're going to talk about is his power and knowledge of all things purpose and presence. And as I've got older and understood the importance of it and the value of it, I just wanted to bring that to the, to the listeners. So Alan has also extensively traveled. Um, so a bit like me, he absolutely has that, that, that book. Um, book? Bug. But that does lead me on to one of the things that Alan, <laughs> that wasn't deliberate, that was a genuine mistake, um, has, you know, kind of led into this book that you are writing. And we'll, we'll touch on that as well later. So Alan, massive thank you for joining me. Welcome to the show. And yeah, let's dive straight in with your experience of you know, Nepal, monasteries in China, and what drives you for purpose and presence? Wow, that's a nice big question to start off with. Um, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> oh, look, I think, um, I think actually kind of if I bring it right back to here, the thing that, that, that really brings so much joy and so much you know, peace and, and, and fulfillment to my life is, is just, is just finding the little drops of magic in each moment. You know, we quite often, it's funny when we sort of tell our life story, or even if we just go talking about stories or going looking for stuff, we look for the big stuff. Yeah. And sometimes that kind of, you know, kind of gets us missing some of the really, really beautiful things that are just happening in front of us, beside us at any moment in time. And so for me, like this is, that's why presence I find is, is so alluring and so enriching is because when we're truly present with someone, we're right here in this moment. And so this is the magic. And actually it's a huge part of, for me, my experience of what our purpose is. Our yeah. purpose is on a human level to bring as much love as possible to the life that we live. And love has so many expressions. You know, that can be sharing, like, you know, your love with your beautiful children, as I know you do, or, 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 or our partners. It can be finding the stuff that really fills our cup and feeds us in life, the stuff we really love. Yeah. Um, and all of these things, you know, when we're, when we're truly in the moment, we're there. You know, we're in real connection with people when we're in work, we're at the most, we're in the most kind of potent state that we can be in. Because when we're present in work, we're not distracted. We're not in some past conversation or meeting. We're not in a future goal or, you know, a story of stress or anxiety about something that's coming up. We're bringing all of our capability, all of our experience, our understanding, our passion, our energy for this task or this conversation, this presentation, 
this thought of you know how do we create a solution right now yeah so in in relationship it's our most enriching place it's our most potent place in work and then in life it's the place that helps us kind of tap back into things like our intuition or other cultures you know have different words for it you know your gut you know yeah. sense feeling in a voice all these sorts of things but it helps us kind of come back to who we are and begin to remember and live the life that we truly want to live not the one that we think is expected of us and that's a really interesting kind of my mind's whirling now so when you when you say the word um your potent self in in work I guess I everyone can massively relate to I'm running late for the meeting. I've got these massive deadlines. Um, God, this is going to be just a waste of my time this hour. And just practicing that, no, I'm going to be fully here, phone off, laptop off, and I'm going to listen to what this individual is saying. I guess all of us aren't very good at that. No, it's hard. It's hard because we, in some ways, we've sort of trained ourselves and become trained to be distracted. Secondly, um technology doesn't help you know buzzing things in our pockets and now we have buzzing things on our wrists if we choose to have them you know so so the the world is kind of can draw us especially the business world into distraction um and but it's not our most optimum state it's actually a real suboptimum state you know in terms of learning and creativity and empathy and engagement and all these things that, that actually is what you know when you're in work there's the kind of things that you're striving for um, yeah. And yet, it's so ironic that we decide and we choose to live in a state. And I kind of take responsibility for my own state. Hence why I kind of use the language we choose or I choose. You know, like if you're distracted, it's your choice. You can blame the environment, but ultimately it's our responsibility. Yeah. You, can, like, you know, the example of your meeting, you, as you said, you can either choose to do what's going to help you be really present in the meeting, or you can actually choose to have the conversation with whoever you need to have to say, perhaps I don't need to be in this meeting or perhaps 10 minutes or 15 or 20 or 30. And again, everyone's got their own, you know, someone might feel they can't do that right now. So allowing this to happen over time is also kind of helpful for you. So you might need to have three or four conversations with your boss for that to happen. Just, you know, plant the seed and lower your expectations around it. But the experience of presence is a lifelong journey. It's not something that you snap into tomorrow. It's just like, I see it so much like physical exercise and getting fit. Yeah. It's like in two ways. One is our level of presence grows as we practice. It's like each time you practice another drop of presence or your, cap your capability to become presence grows with inside you. And it's like, yeah. it's in a, you're just growing that well that, that, Initially, when you start practicing, you normally access it in the practices, but then it starts to flow out into the other aspects of your life, into relationships, into work, into every moment. You're walking down the street and you're suddenly, you know, you see, you're just present. You see this bead of light or, or you hear, you know, the you know, a bee just buzzing in the, in the flowers and you just, you know, captivate it for a moment. And, yeah. And and so, <laughs> sorry. So, yeah, so one is, is, is it, it grows over time, like the fitness, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't not kind of, you don't sit on the sofa watching TV and eating McDonald's or Mac as, as we call it over here. And, um, and then get up one day and go for a run and think you're going to be fit. We it like to think we can, time. but we can't. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's the same with, it's the same with presence. And the other thing like exercise is there's so many different practices that yeah. you, it, it's really important to find the let's just like exercise find the ones that really work for you in your life stage right now so I, a lot of people I, I work with talk about you know like immediately go to meditation and meditation is an amazing and there's thousands of different forms of meditation but it doesn't necessarily work for everyone because of their you know their, their perception of what meditation is at that point in time so but there's other stuff that's really simple really simple that you can do well, OK, so then maybe you can help me, because when it comes to meditation, mm. I am not negative about meditation at all. And I firmly believe in the powers that it can yield. However. Oh, my God, I just can't do it. I, I cannot. I mean, you know me relatively well. And my mind is 
just races all the time and I've I've even tried to have hypnotherapy and you know all of those things and the guy was just like I, you know, it's not gonna work on you how does someone who you know is quite hectic with their life and their mind just naturally what could I try okay in meditation yeah okay or do so, I just sack uh, that off and just try different no, no, tools no. oh you can do whatever you want that's the joy of life it's your choice but um, so when you when you meditate, how do you well, when you yeah, when you meditate? How do you how do you meditate? Do you sit down? You For me, do, I've tried doing the sit down, breathe. I, I try and combine it like when I do my Pilates, for example. Yeah. But as soon as I've done that breathing and I'm slow and I'm quiet. After 10 seconds, my head's going, oh, what's coming next? <laughs> well. 10 seconds is good, just to, just to let you in on that one. So, so uh, <laughs> there's so much in this. So one is expectation. And like expectation doesn't really have many positive outcomes. Okay. It's just a, it's an illusion, right? And, and it draws you, but anyway, so, so, so to get to 10 seconds without a thought, you shouldn't be getting heavy on yourself to start off with. So, so meditation, is not about not thinking. Yeah. It's not about trying to stop thinking. It's about being able to initially recognize your thoughts and separate yourself from them so you can observe your thoughts. And so when, we, when we're able to do that, that starts to unlock some of the benefits of mm. not building so much reaction, so much drama, all these things into our lives because when we're caught in our thoughts and we don't see them, of course, as you know, you know, they get bigger on us. Yeah. And when you can see them for what they are and you can go, ah, there's my mind being creative again. It's such a great storyteller, you know, and, and just like, ah, you know, thanks for that one. Not going to believe it or, or whatever it is. Yeah. That, you know, that, that's really, um, it's, it's one of the foundational of, you know, steps in, 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 a, in a kind of a presence and a meditation practice. And so going 10 seconds without a thought is actually, is actually quite a lengthy period of, of time okay. for someone who feels like they're struggling. And so what you might want to do is when the thought comes up, just recognize it and go, there's a thought, because it's not you, right? When you, when you say there's a thought, you're already creating some distance between it. And then there's so many different ways of, of approaching it but you know one of the things you can do is to almost kind of watch the thought float through you yeah and don't follow it don't try and pull it in don't try and deal with it don't try and push it away don't go there's a thought it's bad because then yeah. you're having a thought because then you're having a thought that it's bad so you know so you're, you're actually it, that you're actually kind of you know increasing the the fire that's on the thought by by trying to push it away or by trying to follow uh, you know trying to yeah follow the thought and make it into a bigger story. And even actually, if that happens, just keep coming back to something where there's a focus point. I mean, that's why breath is such an important thing, but for, yeah. for a lot of people that, that, that you know, that I, I work with and talk to, it can be, it can be a simpler sound to start off with something external. Yeah. And so it might just be like you said, the birds and there's no, there's no good or bad sound. Like sometimes I'll meditate in the city, and there's just sounds of people or cars, but the cars are quite constant. And so I mean, a lot of people will be like, oh, I can't meditate, it's too noisy. Or I can't meditate, there's cars, and I just want the sound of panpipes or something, I don't know, you know? <laughs> like wind rustling through the trees. And that's lovely, obviously. But any thought can, anything that can bring your focus back in on one thing, yeah, then starts to dissolve the busyness of the mind. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that yeah. It brings you back to yourself. It's funny, actually, because sometimes, you know, <clears throat> you do lie there in bed and you put your head down and you start thinking about a thing. And then by mm -hmm. the time it's done this journey, <clears throat> you get to the end and you go, how the hell did I get there? It's a bit like sometimes when you drive and you get in the car and you think, how have I got to my destination? I don't remember getting here. Yeah. 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 The mind is incredible how it can. I mean, that's it. You know, the mind is a creative tool. And so, and it's only one aspect of ourselves, but it's kind of like a little bit of a muscle that we've overdeveloped and yeah. therefore kind of underdeveloped or underfed the other muscles of which one of them we touched on earlier is intuition. Yeah. But something else that you might find helpful 
is um, instead of trying like lying and meditating or in bed or sitting down or doing it with your Pilates um, is because I know you like exercise and you like to walk. You know? Yeah. So, so somewhere on your walk, just make sure you, there's no, no distractions, phones or anything. But somewhere on your walk, just choose 50 meters, 100 meters, whatever you want. Just, yeah. just some, some distance. And it's lovely if it's in nature, but just being outside is in nature because you have the clouds, the sky, the wind, everything around you. And then as you're walking, just walk slower than you've ever walked before. Okay. Slower than your mind even thinks is possible to walk. You know, like just so. For somebody who's so a super fast walker, that's going to yeah, freak yeah. me out. <laughs> totally. So, so just just walk, and as you start to walk, just just breathe normally, not too hmm. deeply, not too shallow. Just breathe normally, and then just begin to feel your feet just touching the ground, step by step, and feel yourself just kind of connecting into that rhythm. Yeah. And as you're kind of just touching the ground and you're breathing, and again, you may want to start by listening to something out externally and then bring it into the breath, but just do that for 50 meters. Okay. And it has an incredible effect of, of just helping bringing you back to presence. And that's, that, that, it, that, that creates a state that is the same as what would be a seated meditative state for you over time. That and would again, work it's the, a lot better. I think with me, I think that would be really good. It's, and it's something that I find that can really help people in, in sort of different walks of life. So if we talk about work, which is, you know, what we were chatting about earlier, I've, I've practiced this for maybe 10 years or so. And it's so helpful when you're about to go into what you think is a stressful, challenging mm. meeting, you're nervous, any of these things. So whenever we go into a meeting, a presentation, any of these these kind of aspects of work, the most important thing and the optimum state that we talked about before that we can be in is to be present, is to be calm, is to be clear, is to have access to all of our, you know, mind and everything else, you know, and be in deep empathy so we can listen to people and co-create solutions, all these things. And, and of course, meditation helps draw us into the present. So, so what can be super helpful is just let's go back to pre-COVID days to start off with. <laughs> if you're yeah. walking down the corridor to the boardroom or to your meeting room, switch your phone off or put it on, on airplane mode because you're not going to need it for the meeting, most likely. And then walk those last 10 or 20 paces the same way. Okay. And then might, You might get some funny looks, but stop it. Just, yeah. just do it. You may well do. You may well do. But then when people, you know, but then if... Then people if ask why. Explain, if you explain to people that what you're looking to do is to access, you know, just get into clarity and creativity or whatever it is that your organisation is about. But ultimately, organisations thrive commercially, if we want to talk about that, yeah. when the humans are in their most optimum state, most collaborative, cohesive, creative, solution finding and productive. And productivity yeah. is about presence not about busyness and um and so this can be something that can really help there the other thing that can really help with is that moment when you are finishing work and how many times do as parents we walk through the door and we miss the magic of the, our children yeah because yeah. they might be doing it but we might still be in our to-do list or we might be in a call that we have to make in an hour and 45 minutes yeah, like i've not, just walked through the door give me give me 10 in, minutes yeah rather than be in that moment for a minute with them or whatever it is. And just because that, that's what we remember when we, when we just, you know, when we pass from this beautiful life is all the moments that we've shared and created. Yeah. We don't think about the phone call we're about to have or the to, to do list. So I, I, I used to use this a lot for the last 50 meters before I would enter the front door at home. And so challenging when you're working from home. So one of the adaptations, like there's a whole bunch of COVID adaptations now for this stuff. Yeah. One of, the things, one of the things I kind of had fun with was at the end of my working day, whenever that is, or the moment when I'm moving from work, Alan, to father or partner, Alan, yeah. I'll close everything down and I will leave home and walk around the block. So I will simulate the commute. Yeah. And then the same thing. So then when I come and I've spoken to everyone about it, so they know that when I come back through the front door, 
I'm here and I'm here with you. And if, yeah. and if I've had to like also manage expectations and say, but maybe in an hour and a half, I have to jump on a call or something, whatever else it is. But what, what, however long that is, I'm there having the most important moments of my day with the people that I love most. And that walking is the same thing. It can really help you just dissolve all the busyness in your mind. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And I am definitely going to try that on the walk. Um, just because I'm fascinated as to how, how I, you know, how I will react to that. I love the idea of, you know, when we're back in the office or it could be walking from the tube to the front door of the office, et cetera. But, but equally, you know, your commute home at the minute is out of this office door into, <laughs> into the living room, yeah. into the kitchen. So just like you say, doing that loop around the block. Um, yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Thank you. I'm definitely going to try that. And I hope that the kind right. of listeners can take something from that as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about your time in the Chinese monasteries and your time in Nepal and how those kind of experiences um, and relationships and culture have, have kind of fed into this purpose and presence and then kind of, I guess, eventually come on to the book. Yeah, yeah. So um, so I guess for the context um, of, of your listeners, um, when I was about, I was in my early 20s, um, as you are when you're in your early 20s and you think you've got life all sorted and dialed. Um, I, left, I left London pretty early after university and um, I went and lived out in the Himalayas for a couple of years. And prior to that, I actually spent some time. I, at one point, I got a one-way ticket to Kazakhstan and traveled over land from there, eventually to Beijing, but it took me to living with some Uyghurs up in the northwest of China and then onto the Tibetan plateau, which is probably what you're also talking about, Ro. Yeah. Got, made some friends with some Tibetan nomads and hung out with them and then into monasteries. And then also, yes, when I was out living later for those couple of years, spent a lot of time just in community out there, you know, like deep in nature, deep in solitude, in monasteries. And, and um, it was kind of, it was just, it was, it was, one of the most kind of beautiful gifts. I didn't know I was going to give, give it to myself. Like I didn't yeah. know what was coming, but it, it, it turned out to be one of the most beautiful gifts that um, I've given myself in my life. And um, the experience, if you can sum it up in a few words, um, which is sometimes tricky, is that in that period, I went through this process. And again, it was intuitive. It wasn't planned, but I went through this process of just stripping off all the layers of identity that I'd created throughout my life up until that point. This, you know, the sporting identity, the da da, da the mate, the da, all these kind of stuff, you know, social identities, all these things, which is what we tend to go about growing. Yeah. And, um, and I realized that um, through experience and also through learning um, when I was out there that, but mainly through experience was that those identities weren't bringing me really deep joy it yeah. would bring me a lot of temporary happiness and buzz and highs and you know all these kind of things but but I, yeah it, it it was the kind of early learning ground through experience of what presence is and like an amazing place to be surrounded you know by the incredible nature in the Himalayas but also obviously the culture out there and in the monasteries just being able to yeah like I guess the monks, if you were like a, um, if you were like a Ironman runner and uh, in the twenties, you got to go and hang out with some amazing personal trainer that taught you all the tricks and stuff. That was kind of the equivalent in exercise for presence and for meditation, just to sit and, and, and sometimes for weeks. Wow. And you know what? I do wonder, you know, I look at the, the culture and, and I have to say, I've never been to Tibet, but it's it's it is on my hit list, and I am going come hell or high water. Um, it makes me wonder about the influence of knowing the simplicity of of that at such a young age, so the children are growing up learning it. Whereas at the minute, it's all about memory, exams, go to university, get a job. We don't give them those base mm. skill sets, and I do wonder if if we did that more across the world um mm. how much more balanced it could be 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Obviously, I'm slightly biased, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, like, I, I, I feel so lucky that I've lived a life with sort of, I guess, feet in different camps, if that's the right metaphor. And so, running yeah. businesses, CEO, and owning and running businesses and selling them, and then consulting and yeah. mentoring, and then you know now guide like presence guide and purpose kind of advisory and stuff and then also those are kind of like expressions of what i do and who i am is is just me and and that's what i come back to and try and bring to the work that i do and to my children and beautiful partner and friends and family and stuff um but the result of that personally is that my life is is really balanced yeah it doesn't mean i don't have stuff that comes up i don't have challenges i don't have pain i don't have all these things but when they come up i don't i don't try and make them like i don't i don't allow my mind to make them bigger yeah over the practice you know like um and so so i think that yes like in the world if we if we can have access to other cultures and we're open-minded to actually infuse those into our lives, then naturally what we're able to do is look at our life and walk around it 360 degrees, not just look at it through the narrow vision of what we've been taught in a, in a very kind of narrow cultural view that we have as well. As you said, it's kind of like you're born, school, work, buy a house, you know, like there's a very... Yeah dominant storyline not that everyone goes through but if you're able to to look at that from different viewpoints then something that happens for, I, I i i kind of experienced was you get to see the good in it not just you don't go like all the way to the other extreme and say oh that's all bad and i'm you know like no. throw a stone system and everything it's like inherently everything is as it is and so what you can then start to do is choose how you are in all of those different systems in life and what your relationship is with them rather than be lost yeah. you know, in the flow of that, of that very strong current and river that is kind of the, you know, the Western culture. Of but I think consumer, it, yeah. And I think it relies on the fact that I guess you, you made a choice when you came out of university, you went and did those things. I did the same. I left university. I went traveling for a year that year I will never forget because it you know broadens the horizons understanding cultures ways of ways of living living and and that's why I just think that's that will own people will only experience that if they then go off and do that so I I just feel like we need more of that as part of the curriculum I'm not saying ditch Mm. the curriculum but where's where's the kind of you know dt of life skills and um um personal awareness and, and, and um, mind health and things like that. So I just think we don't give them the skills to early enough to give them that bug. And like you say, the more you, the earlier you start and the more you practice, the better you mm. become at it. Yeah. There's definitely cases I've seen over here um, where, for example, mindfulness, if you call that as the broad area mm. Um, has been brought into curriculum, um, which is great. There's another thing that's fantastic. um, And still, you know, it's very hard to generalize because different schools take it differently, but also it's a step-by-step. There'll always be someone that will say that there should be more of it. And and absolutely, you know, there may well be, but it's what, so we've got, we've got some early steps of mindfulness coming into the curriculum. We've got some greater, openness to the incredible wisdom in australia that is held within the first nations people yes and so if you talk about you know a desire to go to tibet or the himalayas partly from a cultural perspective as well as nature and everything else sorry that's not a bird (laughs) it's a very noisy one if it is or it's got really bad wind i'm not sure (laughs) (laughs) um but all this is coming in, is, is, is yeah. growing in, in a very traditional curriculum still. But yeah. there's like little drops of positivity. And yeah, I hope that that keeps growing because I think the more that people have access to it, 
then the more expanded our minds become and therefore we can make decisions from different viewpoints and different angles. Yeah, absolutely. And I can only hope that the more people, I guess the world becomes smaller, but I guess something like COVID, I, I, I hope will, will trigger more mindfulness in people. And I think, I, you know, I've heard so many people say, this has made me realise what's important and what matters. And I guess just like anything, it's a shame that something bad has to happen. Oh, my dad had a heart attack or my best friend had cancer before I really understood it or took time to, to appreciate mm. it in life. So I'm hoping in a way COVID gives the, the world that chance to pause, breathe, reflect, um, and anyone, you know, anyone listening to this, I hope that, you know, some of the techniques can work on adults, can work on children and can maybe think about exploring it a little bit, a little bit more. Um, I wanted to go on a little bit in terms of how, what, what kind of triggered you to go into this work? And, and obviously, you're a speaker, you're a mentor. Um, and of course, the listeners, if anyone wants to reach out, please, please do search um, Alan River. Um, what sparked the, the book? So I, for the listeners, I, I had the privilege of having a little sneak peek at it um, a while back, and I read it with my daughters. Tell us a little bit about how that came about and what it's about. All right. Um, so it's called, it's called The Jar of Dreams, and um, so how it came about was one night I was up in the Himalayas and we were um, on this, I was with some local friends and we'd gone off on this fun, slightly crazy adventure of a kind of a trek climb, all sorts of stuff, and um, I was sleeping under this amazing glacier called Narmik. And it just it just was cracking and groaning. Like, I don't know if you've ever been near a glacier or under a glacier nearby. It just vibrates through you. Yeah. Anyway, I fell asleep. And then um, I woke up at some, some point in the night, middle of the night, and I'd had this dream. And so I grabbed my head torch and got a piece of paper and pen I, or pencil. Pen's, you know, not so reliable at that altitude. And... Um, so I was waiting for the motorbike and um, and I scribbled it down and the, the dream was the story of the book. And wow. um, and the book is about the book is about um, rediscovering and living your highest dreams. But um, maybe if I tell the the dream is kind of the synopsis at the same time. So, yeah, the, the, the dream that I had is about this little boy called Ashu. He's uh, 12 years old and he lives in this great slum city called Shabdikosh with his mama and his baby sister Alia who he adores and Ashu wakes up one morning and he's got this uncomfortable weight this feeling in his stomach and he, he doesn't understand it he can't place it because he's mm. he's never had it before so he goes off on his morning chores and and uh, picks up the curd and a few other things. And then on his way home down a back street, he's confronted by Malakim, who's this dark jinn, this spirit, this dark spirit. And Ashu's frozen in fear in front of Malakim. And in that moment, Ashu realizes that Malakim came into his sleep the night before and stole his dreams and replaced them with this dark mist of fear and doubt. And mm. Anyway, Malakim disappears and Ashu can't find him. And so he goes back home and he tries to get on with life because he's also the main provider for the family because Papa died a few years before. Yeah. And so he goes back to work and he tries to get on with things and convince himself that everything's okay, but the weight gets heavier and heavier inside him. And so a few things happen, I won't give away too much. And eventually he, um, <laughs> he makes the big decision to leave Mama and Alia and go in search of Malakim to get his dreams back. So he goes off on this adventure through these mystical lands and has all these experiences. And, yeah. uh, and the rest is in the, the book to be read. So, uh, yeah, that's, but it's, it, it's a story. It's, it's what's called an allegorical fiction or novel. And so it has this life journey underneath, yeah. uh, which is about, yeah, stepping through your fears and living your highest dreams and all the lessons along the way. And then on the surface, it's this, yeah, it's this amazing 
series of worlds that Ashu travels through and yeah. the characters meet on the way and all of these things. So it's been, wow, it's been such a beautiful experience to, to, to write. Well, my experience of writing it was that I would wake up at 4.30, 5 o'clock every morning and it would just be alive. And so it would, it would write itself through. So I just sit down before I went to work yeah. for a couple of hours and just allow it through. And, and to then, illustrate uh, that as well, I mean, allowing that creativity element of those worlds and characters. And uh, I mean, it must have been amazing. Yeah, yeah, it really like it's I can honestly say that I've had um, in the last sort of seven years of deep writing with it, mm. big writing. I've had half an hour that, that has not been just a dream. And that half an hour is actually a meeting that I had in London at some point where I think it was Harper Collins were interested. And then I got a, you know, the old rejection email. Yeah. And, uh, and I realized that I built an expectation up. So I was like, oh, best not do too much of those expectation things anymore. Just enjoy the fact that I'm putting it out into the world and, and see where it goes. But the writing, it's like I step through doorways into the world. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's both a reflection of me. So it teaches me a lot. Yeah and Ashu and all the other characters. And at the same time, it's like this, just this adventure that, that, that I get to live. Cause I, I feel like now in the editing process, which mm. is different to the original writing process of, you know, the 80,000 words, the editing process is like, I step through the doorway and I, so for characters, for example, I'll sit with them until like all the way back to their birth, even right. if they've only got a couple of lines. So that I've truly, sometimes it will take two or three weeks and I'll just sit as them. Yeah. So I'll inhabit them. And so I'll know how they are looking, feeling, reacting, the tone of their voice at any moment in the book. And the same thing with the worlds. I've sort of built this huge, this huge um, character Bible and world Bible that kind of just goes, you know, to the history of all the different worlds and stuff. Yeah. And so it's actually, I haven't told you this, but it's actually spawned three three following i had a feeling it would do but i didn't know exactly but there's three other books to follow so four books in total that have been mapped out and hey forget the london dude who rejected it we all know jk rowling was rejected by every single publisher yeah um well yeah it's it's um uh, it's yeah it, it, but even even that i've been so lucky in a lot of ways that even the people who saw it early on and it's a, like that, that was four years ago. So it's a very different book now, especially in the last 12 months. That was a blessing of COVID lots of writing time. Yeah. Um, but um, they were always so kind in their feedback. It wasn't like the classic copy paste. This isn't not, not, you know, not great or not for us or whatever. Like I remember the first person, and I can't even believe I sent the first version of the manuscript out, but it was to an, it was to this incredible, um, literary agency in in London and mm. they they sent me this response and the owner of the literary agency um, got four editors I think three or four of their editors to read it and they like I printed out this this and it was it was just like dripping in insight and help and it was a thank you but no thanks it's not quite ready it's not quite there for us yet and as I looked at it later I'm like well of course it wasn't it was just a jumble of words I like, yeah. don't even know what I was doing at that point so all of these people I'm so grateful for because they've actually helped me in the learning journey because it's very different to writing and then writing a novel. Right. And, and, and so I spent, I spent seven years learning how to refine and craft a novel. And, um, and so, yeah, all of the so-called rejections have, have always come with just incredible help along the way. And now kind of um, close, very close. There's, three publishers that I can't mention right now um I but, just want um, to know when it's coming out like yeah. literally I mean I, I know I, and actually just to touch on that point that the power of feedback for a thousand letters you may get of rejection the fact that they've actually sat read and given you feedback mm. is hugely valuable and, and and powerful but I want to know when's when are we going to meet Ashu in the world? Well, so, <laughs> so um, very soon now, um, I mean, I'm in the midst of conversations with publishers at the moment. Um, That's so exciting. And, and they're kind of publishers that will bring it 
absolutely to your side of the world, the kind of size of them and stuff and things and, and a few other things. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I'll let you know as soon as, as soon as I, as soon as I know, but I know also, you will. Um, but as you know, like people, if people who are interested, like, cause for me, for me, the purpose of the book is to help people rediscover and live their highest dreams. So yeah. what is a part of that is not just being restricted to the book, but on the website, through the emails, and then on Insta. things like Instagram and stuff. It's sort of, you know, like my hope for that is that a community grows where people can kind of come and share their dreams. And I will certainly support people along the way, you know, either just by yeah. giving them time and love and support, or if I know people, I will also, you know, as you know, that's just a fun part of my life is just to introduce people to others who might be able to help. So I, I kind of see all those kind of digital channels for me is more about less kind of pushing community and more just about building a community of dream makers because we all have them big and small yeah and there's no you know like I, what the only thing that stops us living our dreams are fears and so one of the things we can do to get through our fears is to share them and then to get help and, and support along the way to acknowledge them share them and then be in a community that can help you you know just step through them bit by bit and start to yeah, dissolve yeah. So and so for anyone who's who's listening and want to kind of um follow the journey you know as, as i have been doing what where do we find you on insta and facebook what's the link so yeah so um well the website is simply the jar of dreams.com yep and then insta is probably the best place which is just the jar of dreams it's at the jar of dreams um can't even remember what the Facebook is right now, but we'll have to put it in the show. Instagram, in the show. Instagram will do. Um, yeah, and then there's also stuff that I also do through the book as well um, coming up, um, but more around the, the the kind of life messaging and stuff. Yeah. Um, through into like the emails from my from my newsletter and stuff on on, on my site, which is alanreva.com, which is a l a n r i v a dot com. Yeah. So. Awesome. And I will obviously, um, when this uh, podcast goes out, I'll copy those links and, and put them oh, into to, to, to the information. Listen, the time has, has flown by and um, I just want to say a massive, massive thank you. I really do wish we could inject more of the importance of purpose and presence in our everyday lives. And I hope that the listeners have taken something from this and got some great tips. I am definitely, and I'm going to WhatsApp you in, in a few days. I'm definitely going to try that slow walk. Um, my husband will probably be in the background giving me a very slow clap at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> the neighbors um, will be scratching their head and it's like, what's happened to Ro? It's like, like she on drugs? Like, what's going on? Um, <laughs> but no, I'm definitely going to try some of those things. And, I, you know, I urge the listeners to give them a go too. And listen, best of luck with signing hopefully all three of those um, book deals and I and I cannot wait um, to carry on the story and read it with the girls because I know they both loved it um, as did I actually it's and that's the thing actually it's not just a kid's story it's it's it touches me as as well as I guess like the Harry Potter books you know as an adult you were gripped and the kids loved it too so I cannot yeah. wait I've noticed it's gone very dark where you are is it now night time yeah. It's, it, I should have probably thought about that and put a light on, hadn't I? But uh, yeah. <laughs> only just in the last five minutes. So obviously, you know, Alan's in Sydney, so he's like eleven hours ahead or something. So um, eight, eight p.m. So the sun is just about to start setting. Yeah. Oh, listen, Alan, thank you so so much. Genuinely, I'm thrilled to have you on, and um, oh, yeah, I look forward to the episode coming out. Yeah, it's been so lovely to hang out, and uh, let me know how you go with the walking. I will do for sure. Thank you, Alan. Have a great evening. Take care. Have a lovely day. Bye. So that's it. You've made it. The show's over. Thank you for being with us. I hope you've been able to take something away, maybe solve a problem, or just know you're not alone. Here's hoping it made you smile with a few laughs along the way. Please feel free to find me on all social media channels, and you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just search the Rona Morale podcast. Have an awesome day, and see you next time.